Many times we need to keep our health in check, but don't know what questions to ask or where to begin. We walk in blindly to our health care provider and walk out none the wiser and maybe even more confused than before. Can you take charge of your health and arm yourself with the questions and preparedness you need? The answer is yes. Welcome to Occupy Health with Dr. Susan Downs. This program will answer your questions and give you the best practices for facing your medical partner in good health. Now, here's Dr. Susan Downs. This is Occupy Health with Dr. Susan. So many guests have talked about toxins and their harmful effect on our health. Last week, Dr. Tom O'Brien said the toxins have killed off approximately half of our animals. Are we next? When I was in Italy, I talked with Innocenzo Marcolini, and he was um, he had a tumor which he connected to his uh, cell phone use, and the Supreme Court in Italy had determined that his tumor, his brain tumor, was caused by his use of cell phones. I also talked to Swiss farmers, and they were telling me that all of a sudden, they all got very sick, their animals got sick, and their plants got sick. They didn't know what was going on until they found out cell towers were being constructed. Perhaps we'll get more to that later. So today we have Dr. Dever Davis, who has written books on cell phone and campaigned about the healthful of health effects from cell phones. She founded the nonprofit Environmental Health Trust in 2007 to provide basic research and education about environmental health hazards and to promote constructive policies. An award-winning scientist and writer, Dr. Davis's work has appeared in more than a dozen languages. She was designated a National Book Award finalist for her book, When Smoke Ran Like Water, in 2002. Her most recent book, Disconnect, was selected by Time Magazine as a top pick in 2010. She received the Silver Medal Award from the Nautilus Book for her courageous investigation for, quote, news that did not make the news, quote. She was also on the 2007 Nobel Prize winning team with Al Gore on his investigation with climate change. More about Dever can be found on our website, www.eh. Trust, T-R-U-S-T dot org. There has been exponential use in wireless technology. There are more wireless subscriptions in the U.S. than there are people. And in the U.S. is an average of 145 hours of cell devices per year per person. Is there a health risk here, Devra? I think we can say at this point it depends on how people use these devices. We know that those who use cell phones regularly for 10 years or more do have a significant increase in a highly malignant and aggressive tumor of the brain called glioblastoma. And we know this because studies have been done of people with this disease comparing those who do not have the disease and asking them questions about their cell phone use. Uh, In addition, we have experimental studies most notably the one released this year from the national government of the United States, the U.S. National Toxicology Program, and they have done controlled studies of animals exposed to the same level of radiation, which is to say a level that does not produce heat, and the animals get the equivalent of 36 years' worth of exposure in their studies. And what they found is that, unfortunately, there is a highly aggressive, highly malignant, and very rare tumor of the brain, the same tumor as occurred in people, glioblastoma. And in addition, other studies have found damage to the nerve cells of the hearing nerves, and these are uh, called vestibular schwannomas or acoustic neuromas, meaning a tumor that goes around the sheath of the nerve that is protecting your ability to hear. And these tumors have also been associated with uh, heavy cell phone use. So, in fact, if you keep a phone next to your brain, stop doing that now because manufacturers advise that phones have to be kept a distance from the body. If it's an Android, the operating system tells you to keep it 15 millimeters away. If it's an iPhone, it says 5 millimeters. We at Environmental Health Trust advise that you want to keep your phone on speakerphone and use it with a headset and not have it next to the brain at all. 
Aren't these war- warnings on our f- uh, for iPads? Isn't it worse? Isn't it eight minutes? I mean, eight um, inches. inches away from the body. Well, actually, <laughs> you know that's changing as we speak. But um, because these iPads have proximity sensors, they they may actually go to a lower. Um, level of radiation when they're right next to the body. Uh, we don't have the uh, accurate information on this because there is no independent testing. Industry basically submits their test data to the FCC and the devices are approved, as is. And there's very, very little monitoring or surveillance of the system. They, they submit one device to be tested. Uh, there's no random sampling. There's no monitoring and there's no surveillance. So, Unfortunately, these devices were originally created mostly for use by medical and military users back in the 1990s when phones cost thousands of dollars and it cost over $1,000 a month to to use a phone. And many of the studies that were done in the 1990s studied these early users. They're not really relevant to us. In fact, the early phones were much more powerful in terms of radiation, and power can play a role. Current phones are extremely weak in radiation. They have almost no power at all. So why would they have a biological effect? Well, we think the reason for the biological effect has nothing to do with power. It has to do with the signal, which is constantly checking 900 times a minute with the tower. Where are you? Here I am. Where are you? Here I am. It does what's called a handshake. And when, so long as the phone is on, even if you're not talking, if it's in your pocket, if it's wherever you keep it, it is sending a signal. So is that signal or when it's constantly searching for stations is when we're at most at risk? Well, it goes, it's, it's a smart device. So it goes to peak power whenever it senses a new tower or a new signal. Uh Okay. Now, in these studies, was the, there was an association between brain tumors and cell phone use. Was this a causal effect or just an association? Well, as you know, in medicine, what we, we have several principles for inferring causation. We ask, is there a dose-response relationship? That is, are those with the heaviest use getting the most tumors? And the answer here is yes. We ask, is there biological plausibility? Does it make sense to think that weak, pulsed cell phone radiation could cause a brain cancer or other devices could cause a brain cancer or cause other problems to the nervous system or the immune system. And the answer here is there are growing reports of experimental studies, some conducted in cell cultures, but some conducted in whole animals, showing that it makes sense biologically to think there is this relationship. And finally, we also look at whether we have human data. Now, unfortunately, as with tobacco, the only way to get human data is to wait. Now, the question I ask and that we at Environmental Health Trust are asking parents and teachers around the world today is, do you really want to be experimenting on your children? Shouldn't we be taking precautions now to reduce their exposure while we continue to design devices with changes in hardware and software so that they emit less radiation? And I think it's clear to me now that industry is, in fact, coming up with devices that emit less radiation. They understand they have to do that. And frankly, there are also some lawsuits underway right now that are going to compel them to do that. Oh, tell me about these lawsuits. Well, <clears throat> there are several different law firms that have joined forces. I'm not aware of the, all of their names. <clears throat> and they represent a number of people who have died with brain cancers. One of them was um, a young man in Colorado, who worked uh, right underneath several very high-powered towers and also was a heavy cell phone user. So he was getting multiple exposures, and he worked in a chemical lab. Another was someone that you and I interviewed together, Brett Bocook, at one point an Olympic-class rower who trained, you know, dragging trucks uh, uh, across the road with his body and was an incredibly fit athlete, a typical California guy who uh, ate all the healthy foods in the world. But from the time he was uh, a young man, he was glued to his phone and he collapsed in the shower uh, when he was in his 40s uh, with a massive brain tumor that unfortunately ultimately killed him. 
I also talked to somebody whose son worked for Ted Kennedy, and the, the reports to the son come back that the Kennedy family suspected uh, Ted Kennedy's cell phone might have been connected with his glioblastoma. I've heard that as well. I'm, you know, obviously, um, I think it would be important for the Kennedy family themselves to uh, become more engaged uh, in this issue because there are a lot of there's a lot of speculation because the senator was known to be a heavy cell phone user. But that's you asked me whether this is a causal relationship, and I think the answer is yes. At this point, it is because we have animal evidence showing, under controlled circumstances that animals exposed in their lifetimes to what a human can get in 36 years will develop this very unusual and aggressive tumor of the brain, as well as, by the way, tumors of the heart and hyperplasia of the heart. We have human studies, a growing number of which from other countries, in Sweden and France in particular, where they find that those who view cell phones for the longest do have the highest risk of uh, glioblastoma, this malignant brain cancer. And interestingly, the work of uh, Professor Leonard Hardell has found that when you look at people who start to use cell phones as children, their risk is four to to eight times greater by the time they are um, adults from brain cancer, suggesting that the younger you are when you start regular use of holding a phone next to the brain, the greater the risk of brain cancer. I might also like to add as a scientist that it'll be very hard to do these studies because it'll be very hard to find adequate controls. For example, uh, cordless phones in the home, some of them are much worse than cell phones, so that's certainly going to come confuse the results. So it's going to really be hard to find controls who are not using cell phones or not using uh, cordless phones, which also have a great risk. You're absolutely right, um, Dr. Susan. I, th- I think I would add something there. Most people don't realize that a cordless phone, like a cell phone, is a two-way microwave radio. And a cordless phone is like a small base station in your home. Like routers, if you have a cordless phone, it should be located as far away from wherever people regularly spend time. Well, of course, it defeats the purpose of having a cordless phone nearby. Um, The Swiss require that cordless phones be sold so that they are quiet, that is to say they are not constantly radiating 24-7, except when you use them. These are eco decked type phones, and you can get them, but you have to specially order them in the United States. It would be a very simple matter if our manufacturers just agreed to those guidelines. Why don't they agree to these guidelines? You'll have to ask them. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I'm hearing static. Are you guys picking that up? I'm hearing it. Well, is there something we can do about this? I'm wondering if it's the phone. It's not for me. Um, Can we ask your sound person if we should try to call again? Uh, Are you there, sound person? Justin? He might not be. All right. We're going to have to edit this out. I'm sorry. Okay. So, um, anyway, is there anything on the phone that warns, our cell phones, that warns us about this risk? Well, in fact, uh, we have uh, on our website at ehtrust.org, if you go to read the fine print or fine print warnings, you will see that uh, all manufacturers of all of these devices have fine print warnings that say something like, if you use the device closer than this distance to your body, you will exceed the as-tested guidelines. For example, those of your listeners who have an iPhone can go to the settings on the iPhone. And when you go to settings, you go to general. And when you click on general, it brings you up to about, which is at the top of the screen. Then you go all the way down to the bottom to something called legal. And you click on legal, and that brings you to RF exposure guidelines, where it says that if if the device is held closer than 15 millimeters or 5 millimeters, the distance varies depending on the device, you can exceed the as-tested exposure guidelines. Well, let's talk about those guidelines. Those guidelines were set in 1996. Would you like to ride in a car or fly in a plane that only follows the guidelines for safety of 1996? I don't think so. So we have old guidelines, and what were they based on? Uh, Those guidelines uh, were based on um, the fact that you want to avoid heating the brain. And heating the brain is not the only thing we have to worry about at this time. Tell me more about that. What do we well, originally, the tests were done on um, 
animals. Uh, and they were trained to run a maze. As you know, we do animal research, and we give animals a food reward when they run a maze. And we, they learn how to do that because we start them out starving. They're very hungry. They want to get out of the maze, and they quickly learn how to do that. These um, standards were set using a rectal probe in the animals to see what temperature their body had to reach for them to stop trying to seek food when they were starving. And that was the basis from which all of the standards for humans were set to avoid heating based on an animal's internal temperature. Now, what's, here's what we know. Heating is not the problem we have to worry about now. Phones today do not produce much heat. But they do, however, disturb our membranes. They do increase the production of reactive oxygen species, which are chemicals that form in our body that we think are predictive of damage such that can lead to cancer or immunological problems or neurological problems. So now we have new science, studies in animals, showing that low levels of pulsed digital radiation can and do affect the nervous system and do affect the health of animals at levels that phones can emit today. Yeah, I was talking to a Dr. Suleiman from Turkey. He was doing research. If you hold the cell phone near the abdomen of a pregnant animal, that there's DNA changes in you know in the genetic material of the offspring. Yes, as a, as a matter of fact, Dr. Suleiman Kaplan and Dr. Nezrin Sahan of Turkey have produced a, a very substantial body of evidence where they've devised controlled conditions. They don't just hold the phone next to the abdomen of the pregnant animal. They create a horn antenna using technology devised by Nokia and others, and they let the animals run freely, but they are being exposed during pregnancy. And then they look at the offspring, and here's what they've found. In the case of Suleiman Kaplan, he has consistently shown that when you look in the brains of animals that have been prenatally exposed to cell phone radiation from a GSM phone. Many systems in the United States rely on that kind of system. The offspring that have been prenatally exposed have smaller brains and more brain damage. Looking specifically at the composition of the hippocampus, the hippocampus, as you know, as a psychiatrist, Dr. Susan, is critical to memory, balance, a whole bunch of very important things that we have to do with our brains. So these animals, prenatally exposed, have smaller brains and more damage to their hippocampus, particularly the pyramidal cell formation is impaired. Nezrin Sahan has done work with rabbits and rats and mice, also prenatally exposing them, and also showing that these animals that are prenatally exposed, when they're born, they have defects in their skin, in their liver, in their eyes, and in fact in their testis. And the defect in the testis is particularly important because, as I've recently shown with a colleague of mine from Iran, the defect in the testis means that the offspring may have difficulty reproducing or they may reproduce defective offspring themselves. And all of this from prenatal exposure to cell phone radiation in animals. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing to our children? What are we doing to ourselves? Actually, we have some data on humans right now. Studies have been done in Australia by Sir John Aitken, a Cambridge University-trained expert in male reproductive health, and recently he published a review article that confirmed that there is damage to human males from cell phones. He's done studies, as has Ashok Agarwal at the Cleveland Clinic, and what they have shown is that if you take sperm samples from men and you divide them into two different aliquots in test tubes. And one test tube gets exposed under controlled conditions to cell phone radiation, and the other is not. That you can measure the output, and you can look at the quality of the DNA of the sperm. You can also look at the DNA count. Now, of course, sperm aren't meant to live in a test tube, and they will die. But if you look at the number of sperm in the unexposed test tube and compare it to the number of sperm in the exposed test tube, there are three times fewer sperm in the test tube that was exposed to cell phone radiation. 
And if you look at measures of the mitochondria, which is the engine of the sperm, you find that there's three times more damage to the mitochondria of the sperm. Now, you know, you need a lot of sperm to make a healthy baby. Do you know why? No, why? You need about a half billion sperm to make a healthy baby, ideally, because sperm don't know how to ask for directions. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I also understand Dr. Martha Herbert, connected with Harvard, has postulated that the electromagnetic frequencies can cross the blood-brain barrier, which is the uh, part that protects our brain from outside invaders. And this can lead to brain oxidative stress, as you say, brain inflammation. And we've discussed inflammation and oxidative stress in many lectures before, but this, as Dever says, leads to DNA damage, change in the cell structure, change in the cell um, nucleus, and change in the cell membrane, which determines what goes in and out of the cell. So this sounds pretty crucial. I would quite agree. And Dr. Herbert runs a clinic at Massachusetts General Hospital that specializes in treating children on the autistic spectrum. And she looks at a variety of factors that are important. And one of them, certainly in her opinion, is exposure to cell phones and other digital devices. There appear to be some children who are exquisitely sensitive to this radiation. And they... Um, really do well when you remove them from it. Um, And some of their schools are now making an accommodation for these children. But just imagine uh, if parents are not as sophisticated and a child comes home complaining of headaches and not feeling well, uh, they may think the kid is just a complainer, a malingerer, when in fact there's a real problem going on. And you need to find out whether there's been some recent change in the use and exposure of these devices in schools. As one example... <clears throat> laptops are no longer called laptops. Children are using tablets all over the world. They're called tablets because they belong on tables. They do not belong on young little bodies right over their reproductive organs. That's, they're tested, at, as you noted, at eight inches away from the body of a large adult male. But as to Dr. Herbert and her important work, she has a website Dr. Martha Herbert, MD, that I would urge your listeners to look at, and she's been doing really important work. The blood-brain barrier, as you indicated, is designed to keep bad things out of the brain. And studies were done, as I indicated in my book, Disconnect, the Truth About Cell Phone Radiation. Studies were done in the 1970s, long before cell phones ever existed, showing that microwave radiation, then being used to build radar, could weaken the membrane of the brain. And the studies that were done were quite eloquent and done by um, Dr. Alan Frey for the Office of Naval Research. What he did was to take animals and inject them with a dye that would go throughout the body, and he found that it never got into the brain. But then he exposed those animals to microwave radiation, the same kind that we have from cell phones today. And injecting the dye into the vein of the animal, he found that the dye did get into the brain after a few hours after that exposure. Now, that's where it gets really interesting because other scientists, in an attempt to <clears throat> replicate the study, injected the, da- the dye into the stomach of animals and then saw no effect in the brain within an hour. Now, as you know, it takes a long time for things to get from the stomach into the blood system. And so that study was widely reported as a, quote, negative study when failure to replicate Dr. Fry's work when, in fact, it was not done accurately. So it sounds like, according to Dr. Herbert, there might be a connection uh, between cell phones and autism. For example, autism has many things that can contribute to it. And I understand in Korea there's actually something called digital dementia. And in Korea they have an extremely high rate of autism rated as 1 out of 38. So perhaps that's a contributing factor to, to, of the many factors that are contributing to autism. You know, that's a very good point, Dr. Susan, and I think the answer is we don't know, but we, we really do need to find out. It's a very important question. Why uh, all over the world, in the industrial nations in particular, <clears throat> is autism increasing? 
and we don't have an answer to that question. Certainly, the research that's been done by our Turkish colleagues suggests that prenatal exposure plays a role in how the brain develops. And as you indicate, um, Korea has a serious concern with autism there. So neuropsychiatrists there have, have diagnosed digital dementia in middle school children, and they say it's characterized by MRIs that show a deficit of development in the parts of the brain that are important for empathy and learning okay. and We're attention. Why- We're winding down to a break, so we will come back and learn more about this as well as what we can do to protect ourselves from this. So I'll talk to you in a minute. You are listening to Occupy Health with Dr. Susan Downs. We'd love to hear from you about today's show. Send your email to drsusan at occupyhealth.com. That's Dr. Susan at occupyhealth.com. Now, back to this week's program. Hi, this is Dr. Susan back with Deborah Davis. Uh, we were talking about autism, which has increased markedly in this country. It used to be one out of 2,500. Now, some of the estimates are down to one out of 46 children. What is going on? It's not just our increased awareness and increased ability to diagnose it. There's a lot of environmental factors, many of which we've discussed in this program, and it sounds like cell phone radiation, et cetera, can be one of the contributing factors. Um, I also understand that some people postulate that in addition to the cell phone radiation causing inflammation, oxidative stress, leaky blood-brain barrier, some people postulate something called the calcium channels are also affected. So it sounds like the scientific research is coming out, and why is it not coming out to the public? Well, that's a very good question, and I think that unfortunately right now in the United States... Public information is at risk uh, for lots of reasons. And uh, the ability to talk about this issue independently and publicly has always been uh, very, very difficult. I know at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, Ronald Herberman in 2008, who was the associate chancellor of the university's medical center and the director of the Cancer Institute where I worked, issued an advisory to his staff of 3,000 professionals saying that based on what he knew at that time in 2008, people should take basic precautions to keep phones away from their heads and bodies. And I know that within two years, he was no longer working at the Cancer Institute for a variety of reasons. But I also know that people who've worked in this field have found it a rather challenging field to maintain employment and funding for. Uh, When Om Gandhi in 1996 produced studies showing that children absorbed substantially more radiation than adults. He was then, at that time, working for Motorola and other cell phone manufacturers and the U.S. government, and all of that work ended when he started to publish research showing different exposures of children. Fortunately for us and for him, he was a full professor at the University of Utah in electrical engineering, and a very distinguished scientist recognized world round for his pioneering work in modeling brain uh, brain exposure to cell phone radiation. So he continued to produce studies showing, for example, that if you keep a cell phone in your pocket, the levels of radiation in the phone are four to eight times above those that it's tested in. Now, why is that? That's because phones are tested in a holster. That's how they're tested, away from the body. They're tested with a spacer in terms of the brain. And, and effectively, this means that you can get more radiation in. When he did that work, he basically lost his funding. Because he was a full professor, he was able to continue. A similar thing happened to Henry Lai at the University of Washington. And this is Dr. Lai, who's one of the most distinguished and talented researchers in this field, is no longer actively conducting research in this field. He invented uh, a type of assay called the comet assay with his colleague uh, Singh uh, back in the 1990s. And they just picked uh, wireless radiation, then only known as uh, 900 megahertz, um, not, meaning 900 million times a second the cycles would beat, to study and see what it would do to the rat brain. 
they found that the rat brain was damaged uh, in a significant way. When he submitted this work for publication, some folks in industry tried to get the journal that had accepted it to unaccept it. Others wrote to the university and tried to get him fired. Others wrote to NIH accusing him of scientific fraud, which, as you know, is a dreadful thing for a scientist to face. And when all of these things failed, as they did, and they published their results, then Motorola hired a public relations firm, Mongavin Associates, and they sent a memo, which is in my book, Disconnect, The Truth About Cell Phone Radiation. And that memo said, we have to, quote, war hyphen game the science. War games. That's the way the response was. I'm encouraged that industry has finally understood that war games aren't going to work here. And frankly, that's where the lawsuits are giving them a very powerful message. There is no question in my mind, nor in the mind of growing numbers of experts in this field, that cell phone radiation can cause brain cancer, particularly in people who are heavy users for longer periods of time. Now, having said that, and having looked at people who basically lost their jobs because of this work, <clears throat> I will tell you that you are not doomed no matter how long you've been using your cell phone next to your head because we are born with DNA repair. And DNA repair is a wonderful thing and allows us to recover from damage. So eat your vegetables, sleep in the dark, and do the other good things that you, I'm sure, have been talking about with your listeners, and you will reduce your risk of developing uh, anything like a brain cancer related to cell phone radiation. There is a growing literature showing that melatonin can reverse and block the damage that would otherwise occur from cell phone radiation. This is an experimental literature, of course, with animals showing that if you expose the animal to cell phone radiation, you get a certain damage to their cell. If you expose them to cell phone radiation and melatonin, that damage is half as much. Wow. Sounds a lot like what we went through with the cigarettes in the past that, you know, the, it sounds like there's a lot of studies that come out favorably that done by independent researchers. And there's a lot of studies saying that's a bunch of nonsense funded by the industry. So it sounds like the cigarette issue all over again. Well, it does have some similarities, except there are some very big differences that I think all of us would acknowledge. And the biggest difference is that cell phones can and do save lives. They do play a positive role in our society. They have revolutionized commerce around the world today. A farmer in Africa can pick up the phone and find out what the price of wheat or whatever commodity it is they're selling uh, hundreds of miles away. So phones have changed what we can do in a good way. So unlike cigarettes, which the only positive role of cigarettes was that there were five southern economies that were highly dependent on the revenue from tobacco, and that was a big deal. Right now, we have a huge global industry for wireless radiation. We have a lot of constructive things that are being done with wireless radiation. So we really have to have a more full and frank conversation of the risks and the benefits and of the technology and what we need to do to reduce our exposures while continuing to advance our ability to do so. Now, aren't babies, because their skulls are they're so much thinner and their heads are so much smaller and their cells are growing so much more quickly, aren't they at increased risk, especially if a mother puts a tablet or a baby monitor close to them? Absolutely. Um, children are at increased risk, and that's why we at Environmental Health Trust are offering information for parents and teachers about ways to reduce their exposures. And there are some really idiotic, frankly, idiotic new technologies out there. You can buy a onesie, a one suit for an infant that includes a built-in cardiac monitor and pulse detector. So you don't have to bother to pick up your infant. You can just let the wireless radiation in the suit tell you what the baby's heart is doing. Um, that's a dreadful idea. You can also get a wireless device that you can put into the vagina when you're pregnant so you can play music closer to the heartbeat and brains that are developing of your embryo or fetus. Wow. Aren't there some women that have uh, very unusual breast cancers because they put their cell phone in their bras? 
there a case series that we are developing with other scientists like Dr. John West and um, Southern California has looked at younger women with unusual breast cancers. The cancers have developed sometimes in women as young as 21, right at the surface of the skin, right under the antennas of the phone that they kept in their bras. And these tumors are so unusual because 21-year-old women do not get breast cancer. And they're so unusual in their location, right under the antenna, that a number of physicians um, have raised concerns about this. And I would urge if any of your listeners know of such cases, they should send that information to you and we can continue to work together in developing that case report. Great. That sounds really good. Now, I also understand that it's very high risk for problems when you're in a moving vehicle, such as a car, a train, an elevator, or an airplane, because uh, not only are you enclosed by this metal object, but also the cell phone is sending strong signals and weak signals, etc., while it searches for a station. So is that an increased risk? Well, w- people are unaware of the fact that the only safe way to use a phone in a car is when you run the um, signal through the car antenna radio. That's the, the Bluetooth. If you have a phone that's not connected to Bluetooth in your car, then basically, as you said, as you're moving through space, the phone is smart. It will keep trying to find a signal from the next tower. And each time that phone goes from one tower to another, it goes to maximum power. And it's, we think it's not the average exposure that's important, but the peak. And repeated peak exposures over time may be more important. So that's why some of these studies that go into schools and they measure the exposures, particularly if the students aren't there and they're not using their tablets and the whiteboards and the mobile phones all at the same time. If the students are not using all the devices at the same time or they're measuring the average over 24 hours instead of the peaks, then it's really not biologically relevant. We believe it's the repeated exposure to the peak, the repeated something like this. over and over and over again, that we think weakens membranes, creates damaging reactive oxygen species, and contributes to the damaging effect that this radiation can have over the long term. Isn't it also a factor that you're in an enclosed metal uh, object, and so your head becomes yes. more vulnerable? Absolutely true. Like, it's, that's how a microwave oven works. You know, you can see into the oven because there's a mesh screen on the window. But ovens <clears throat> work by containing the microwave radiation within the metal box. And you are in a metal box when you're in a car or a train. That's why the Israelis have a website called Tenuda, and that website advises against using a phone when you're in a moving vehicle, except if you have it through the car antenna. What about an airplane? I'm actually not aware of how it works in an airplane. First of all, when you're in an airplane, you're not connecting to the um, cell system below, but to a system that's been set up on the plane. And I frankly have not studied that. Okay. So what can our listeners do, do to use safe phone? Well, the most important thing is they can get informed by looking at the operating system of their own device. And now, from now on, they can use a speakerphone or headset, and you can program your phone so that it only answers on speakerphone, and you can make sure that you have a headset available when you're going to be in a uh, public space because, of course, it's annoying to be talking on a speakerphone and people listening to your calls, uh, and people don't want to have that bother as, as well. So using a speakerphone or a headset is important. Use phones for essential calls. Do not let children use phones except for emergencies, and it's important to understand the cell phone is not a toy and that the new studies from the U.S. government certainly tells us that the long-term risk is real and it's something we can reduce and control. I think, in addition, keep in mind that when the signal is weak, when you have a few bars as opposed to a lot of bars on your phone, that's the time that you do not want to use your device. Because the weaker the signal is in the phone, 
the faster the phone will drain its own batteries to look for uh, information. It's, it's programmed to do that, and therefore, the greater exposure you will be subject to. So it sounds like distance is our friend. Exactly. That is, in fact, one of our mottos at Environmental Health Trust that you can find on our website at ehtrust.org. Distance is your friend. Okay. And it's also, what about Wi-Fi? Well, <clears throat> Wi-Fi uses the same frequency as a phone. The power is different, uh, and it really depends on a lot of variables. Where is your router located? Um, how many devices are you using? Uh, can you uh, program your router, as many of them can be programmed, to go to sleep? We don't really need routers in all of these buildings all over the world to be on 24-7. It's a drain of electricity. It's creating greenhouse gases, and it's creating exposures that can be avoided. So Wi-Fi has a risk as well? Yes, it does. Okay. So children in a school where they have Wi-Fi rather than hooked um, online directly into the computers have increased risk? Yes, indeed. I understand some countries such as Israel and France are taking steps so that the children are exposed to less Wi-Fi. Well, in fact, in France and Israel, you cannot have Wi-Fi in preschools, in which, believe it or not, there are actually some online preschool programs that have been devised, which I think are horrifying for many different reasons. And also in Belgium, you cannot, it's not legal to give a phone to a, a seven-year-old. In Turkey, it's against the law to advertise phones with and for children. Um, around the world, there's growing recognition of the need to reduce kids' use and exposure to these devices. There's even concern in Sweden, where children got laptops as young as age three, that now they're seeing a decline in math and reading scores in the older kids that started out with all of these digital learning. So they're rethinking the fact that digital learning sounded great, but it appears not to be a good thing to do to little kids for a number of, of reasons having to do with the way the young brain learns. It learns better with eye contact with a person with a crayon in their stubby fingers and pencils and not with just drawing onto, onto tablets. Um, there's a whole rethinking of that going on in uh, educational theory uh, today. And the websites of the Israeli government and the French National um, Institute for Research on this subject do include information about why and how to reduce your exposures. I understand Berkeley, one of uh, the most interesting places in our country, has passed a law about the right to know uh, so that when people buy a cell phone, they get accompanying information. I understand there's quite a bit of push to try to prevent that. They tried Indeed. in San Francisco, and it, they had to back off. Right. Well, in 2010, we worked with the mayor of San Francisco, Gavin Newsom, and the city council, and they unanimously passed the cell phone right to know legislation. The industry sued. They said, you cannot force us to tell you what's buried in the phone about how to use it. And although the city won in that lawsuit, technically, they agreed not to enforce their own law because the industry threatened them with having to pay their legal costs, which would have been quite substantial because they hired the most expensive, most talented legal people in the world to represent them, the former U.S. Solicitor General, uh, Ted Post, who's a brilliant lawyer. Well, move forward into Berkeley. Berkeley passed a, a, a very modest law. It says that people have a right to know what information is in the phone about how to use it at a distance from the body before they buy the phone. That's it. It's a very, very, very simple statute. It was drafted in part by Professor Lawrence Lessig, former director of, of the Safra Center of Ethics of Harvard Law School. Professor Lessig and Professor Robert Post, the dean of Yale Law School, have agreed to defend this Berkeley statute. And indeed, it was defended by Professor Lessig and his colleague from Harvard at a U.S. Circuit Court review of this law, which is being challenged yet again by industry that says you can't force us to tell you what's buried in your phone. Yes, it's and at we, the Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals where the judge seems to be favorably inclined toward the industry stamp, so it's in jeopardy as we speak. Well, yes. One of the judges of that court is married to a man with major holdings in telecom venture capital companies. 
And uh, we believe she's going to have to recuse herself from that case as a result. And also that the decision is ultimately going to go to the Supreme Court. And we will see what happens, because I know Professor Lessig and Professor Post are determined to defend it. And we believe at Environmental Health Trust that people do have a right to know. And that's why your radio program, Dr. Susan, is an important part of this effort to let people know what is in the phone, how they need to protect themselves. And that's why I'm here. What about so many people are selling devices, and I know there's controversy about this, you know, things that you can put on your cell phone that can help protect you. I know of no independent evaluation of any of these devices that suggests that it works. However, I did see testing of the Pong case several years ago and see evidence that it could reduce some radiation from some phones at that time. I am not aware of what that company is doing now uh, in that regard. But with respect to these chips and things that people buy that spend hundreds of dollars on to reduce the radiation, I know of no evidence that they work. Okay, I would like to interject just a, a, a different opinion so the listener can decide for themselves. There's some people who do studies, kinesiology, muscle testing with the body, which, you know, is probably not scientifically testing, to show that certain th- things can help increase the energy of the body. So that is something that, you know, Dr. Cheryl Selman, who will be on at a later date, would propose that these can help, but that's not going to be detected by any device that you measure in a room. Also, another very interesting thing is is Dr. Abram, who uh, has been working with sacred geometry. The Swiss farmers I mentioned, they all got very sick, and then um, Dr. Abram came in and he did this uh, sacred geometry, which is working with shapes, and everybody got better. It got to the point that the Swiss government was going to hire him to work on all of Switzerland, but then something happened. So... I don't have the answers to this. It's going to be very hard to prove scientifically, but, you know, it's just another point of view. It is indeed another point of view, and as you know, while medicine is, in fact, a science, it's also an art, and I don't in any way deny that there are things that happen that we can't fully understand. All I can tell you is that I know of no independent scientific evaluation of these devices, which are very profitable, that make their manufacturers a lot of money, and there, there are people out there who prey upon people with concerns about radiation to sell them devices that may not work. At the same time, there are some things that make sense. You can, in fact, put a blanket that has metal in it um, around your baby to reduce their exposure to radiation. And there's something called um, the um, belly armor, which, in fact, is a, is a, does provide that kind of protection. As a matter of fact, in Taiwan and China and many Asian countries, when the moment a woman announces she's pregnant, if she's working in a factory, she's given a pregnancy smock. And what is it? It's a smock that contains, uh, embedded in the fabric, metal, so that she's not getting absorption of radiation from wireless or other devices. Any electromagnetic field will, will be blocked going into the area of the pregnancy. Now, in fact, Exposures are highest in the last month of pregnancy when the baby and the skull and the spinal cord are right right close to the surface because much of this radiation does not get far into the body. It gets in perhaps an inch. But that's the time when you're going to get exposure, and that's why we've created the Baby Safe Project, which I believe you are part of. And that project gives information. It was founded by obstetricians and gynecologists like... Professor Hugh Taylor, who is chairman of obstetrics and gynecology at Yale University. And uh, you can find the babysafe.org. Uh, babysafe.org is also one of the partners with whom we are working on at Environmental Health Trust. And that provides information to obstetricians and to their patients about why and how to reduce radiation to the pregnant abdomen. So there are things out there that are being done, and I certainly understand there are technologies that I don't understand, that others are using, and I accept that there are things in medicine that we can't explain. Yes. So I'm just raising the questions. I certainly myself don't have the answers, but the Swiss farmers swear by the sacred geometry that it's helped them. We're coming to a close now, so in closing, Deborah, is there any last message you would like to give to our viewers or how they can get in touch with you? Well, please go to our website, e h t 
www.thetrust.org, and you'll find on there lots of materials. We have free downloads. If you do download and distribute our safety cards, Save the Girls, Save the Boys, the information for young parents, please just send us a note telling us that you've done this as we are building uh, our, our reach around the world. At this point, more than 2 million of our safety pamphlets have been distributed in uh, seven different languages, all available from our website as well. And we really want to encourage people to get involved and get informed because an informed public is what is needed now to move ahead on what we will do uh, to make progress here. Current testing of phones uses an empty bowling ball of a head of a, about a 12-pound head of a 220-pound guy, an empty bowling ball into which you pour liquid, homogenous, uniform liquid. You know that the brain is not homogenous, and particularly children. They're thinner skulls. Their brains contain more fluid. They, we need a much more sophisticated system for testing for children, and I fear that the industry is pushing ahead for this homogenous phantom testing at this time, despite the fact that we have growing reasons why that's not a good idea. So please go to our website. Remember, distance is your friend. Use a speakerphone. Use a headset. Tell your friends and families that they can do simple things now to reduce their exposure to wireless radiation. The risks of radiation are bigger than most people imagine. The benefits like benefits of using it in medicine, are also quite substantial. And the solutions may not be quite as hard as you can imagine. And I'm really looking forward to uh, working with you and others as we press the case for making this world a safer place in terms of reducing wireless radiation as well as toxic exposures throughout. Well said. I would like to make a comment that when she says save the boys and save the girls, she's referring to the testicles and I think the woman's breast. So in closing, uh, I would like to thank Deborah so much for this information. There seems to be a lot of things going on in our health that it's important that we learn about so we can take our health in our own hands. So I encourage you all to um, do your own research so that you can help guide yourself and others in your path toward optimal wellness. So be well, all. I'll talk to you next week. We got the power to change the world. Thank you for listening. Occupy Health with Dr. Susan Downs can be heard live every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time and 11 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Here's to...